Global X interviews social entrepreneurs who tackle some of the world's biggest problems. They are pioneers of innovation that benefit humanity. My name is Karen P. Gorsh. I'm the founder and the CEO of Synergo. Synergo is a design company. We make ergonomic products, really sustainable ergonomic solutions for artists and entrepreneurs in the developing world. My background includes physical therapy and industrial engineering, which what allows me to do the ergonomics piece of it. And I also have a PhD in public health, which helps with the way we go out into the community, really looking for empowerment of the local people. The work that we do in the rural communities in Guatemala helps the women who depend on their craft, their textile craft, for survival. And a lot of times people ask me, well, what do you think you're doing going into Guatemala and changing the culture? Backstrap weaving has been done for centuries. And I love getting that question because it lets me tell them that the idea for this weaving bench that lets the backstrap loom work in harmony with the weaver came from inside the indigenous community. So that's the story I want to tell, which is that for many years I've been wanting to go to Guatemala. I'm a weaver myself, I speak Spanish, and I'm an ergonomist. Finally I let myself do that, and when I got down there through networking, I was able to visit some of the communities where the women meet for their co-op, which means they weave at home and then they come together once a month or something, and they get the raw materials, they turn in their products, and they get paid for them. So we're all sitting around, no, nope, Everyone's kneeling around in a circle because that's their culture and they had one chair in the, the one room home and they gave it to me as the outsider coming in. It was one of those plastic molded chairs. We see them all over the place. So I'm sitting in the chair and I get the chance to ask them what life is like for them. And that leads to them saying, well, it's true. We do have knee pain, our backs hurt, our shoulders get tired. That was, to me, seemed to be a breakthrough in and of itself. These people are stoic and they don't, talk about that sort of thing and they work very hard. So it gave me a chance to say, well, what do you do about it? And they said, well, we try, instead of kneeling, we sit to the side on the ground. We've tried sitting in chairs. When we sit in a chair like what you're sitting in there, the plastic molded chair, and we beat on the, the loom as we're weaving, the chair hops forward towards where the, the loom is tied on the tree. And they were incredulous and, and so we don't use that. As an ergonomist, what I could see is that the people are shorter than the chair is made for. Their feet don't touch the ground, the seat pan is slanted backwards. It was obvious to me why it hopped. So we went out into the courtyard. They showed me, and indeed it hopped. But at the side of the courtyard were some cinder blocks because they were making a new room on their house. It was going to take them a long time. They'd already built one wall. Anyway, we, we got a couple of the blocks, put one under each foot. We folded up someone's shawl put it on the seat to make the seat level. And without a further cue from me, the woman started weaving, and this time when she beat, her spine elongated. The look on her face sold me that it wasn't just some outsider coming in trying to say, get off your knees and do it this way. And the circle, the smiles, almost giggles coming out of the women solidified in their minds that they wanted to pursue this. It took a few years to get funding for it all to come together. I donated my time, but someone had to pay for some of the logistics. You know, you build prototypes and it, and it costs a few dollars to do that. So we've gone through that process and we now have an ergonomic bench that um, allows them to, for example, produce something that used to take three days, they can now do in two. Instead of only being able to weave for half an hour at a time and getting up from the ground slowly and stiffly, even the younger women, they can weave for three hours or so and pain is not the limiting factor. It's that they have other things they need to do throughout the day. At the very beginning, and this was an essential piece for the local staff, the local Mayan women that were part of our um, design team, we went to this one house where there was a woman who's 50 years old, more or less, in a community called San, San Juan La Laguna, and that's on Lake Atitlan in the highlands of Guatemala. And she told us that she'd been weaving all her life since she was a little girl, that because she had been fortunate enough to become connected with a fair trade outlet, she had an ability to actually have a 
viable income from her weaving and she was trying her best to make that happen but it came to that opportunity came to her later in life so instead of being able to kneel to weave which many of them do she she literally could not kneel anymore so she showed us that she sits to weave with her legs stretched out in front of her and the back strap is still around her hips in the same place that's an even more restrictive position and she still has to rock back and forth while she weaves and so we learned from her about what features the chair would need like we were learning from everyone and at the end we she stood up and we were talking to her and she started just to have tears running down her eyes just that subtle evidence that she was deeply touched and she said thank you for coming to ask how we feel because many people many foreigners have come to our town they find out about us and they come and they want to see how we weave. They're interested and they want to see what we make and how we do it. But for me, this is the first time anyone has asked me what it's like for me. Do I have pain? How do I cope with that? And she, of course, also said, and, and I hope that you follow through with this. Please do. And of course, then I was very eager to see her Three months, I think it was, later when we finally had a, the first prototype to go back and we made sure we went to her community to find out what they thought of it and how they, how they liked it. So we closed the loop and she was part of that whole process. We're told sometimes in school, or we're told as professionals to keep our distance. Mm -hmm. We're told about this thing called the Hawthorne effect, which in part means, hey, don't get too pulled in by the touchy-feely things that are going on because it takes a while to see how all of that's going to shake out and what the real results are. We wouldn't have gotten our real measurable results if we didn't have that personal contact with the people. That's something that's very real. It had to be there for her to open up to trust us and for us to really understand what life is like. Because the bench isn't an isolated solution. We need to know that they have problems with their eyesight if we don't know that and we see that they're, they're still bringing their eyes close to the weaving, we think, well, what's wrong? We did everything ergonomically fine. The chair adjusts in its height and all of that. We're going to miss a key component. So we think of the total solution and partner with organizations that get these women who can't afford an eye exam the opportunity to have an exam and perhaps surgery for cataracts or perhaps a prescription pair of lenses that works at the weaving distance. I mean, not that we have every one of these factors in place yet, but that's our total ergonomic solution. Without that, they're not going to use the bench if it doesn't make a difference. It's not making a difference because they need glasses. That's the final icing on the cake, but not something frivolous. I envision a world in which artisans know how to use ergonomics to make good decisions. For example, which products are they really going to make? Someone comes to them and says, we have an outlet, we have a market for this. I want the artisans themselves to say, of the five products you're telling me I can make, three of them I can do at the price you're saying. For these other two, I have to go slower or it's going to hurt my back, it's going to hurt my knees. It's going to take me time to figure out how to do that. I won't do those right away. I want them to even think that they can respond and interact that way or when they're introducing a new product. What price are they going to accept on it based on what a, uh, an appropriate wage is? There's a wonderful movement going on now that's gathering momentum and it's called the Fair Trade Organization and a fair trade outlet for artisans and, and other people who have products that get sold through that mechanism. And what is a fair wage for folks? Well, I think that fair wage needs to encompass more than how much time is the person spending and then a calculation based on uh, what people make in that country or, or region. That's absolutely core. I envision over the next 10 years the possibility that everyone in that chain of making those decisions will realize that one of the solutions for that appro truly appropriate wage is ergonomics so that people's skill level is taken into consideration and so that the risks that are inherent in doing whatever they're doing with their bodies, their minds, mind, body, mind, spirit, the total person is taken into account. Something that physically is harder to do and can lead to pain and disability down the road, maybe they still do it but they do it with choice and they get a, a better, more appropriate wage for it or they choose not to do it.
It's very idealistic, but I think it's essential if people are going to be able to continue using their bodies and working as hard as people do in the developing world. Global X is also on Social Edge at socialedge.org.